Chapter Nineteen of Tilda Jane's Orphans. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begeman, Somerville, South Carolina. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter Nineteen Grandpa's Dream hank's prediction came true but not just in the way he thought it would dodge and grappler as perletta called her two pets dodge being her adaptation of diogenes and grappler a playful allusion to a fighting propensity became in time two fine-looking prosperous shoats and at an exhibition held in kiskaset bore off the prize awarded to young hogs perletta's joy was ludicrous but it was also touching and after one look at her ecstatic face as she stood surveying her two blue ribboned and admired pets in the little country fair hank registered a mental vow not to bereave her of the creatures she loved so dearly they were only pigs but they were her pigs and owing to their upbringing they had developed a most peculiar pig originality they were the worst pigs that ever lived hank declared by feeding one at a time and making the other wait they had become very pugnacious with each other and with perletta and three-sided fights in the back yard were of frequent occurrence now they were of course old enough to feed themselves but for a long time perletta had patiently attended to them one at a time in the little harness room while she presented the bottle to one the other would bite her feet and butt against her knees until hank discovering her one day undergoing this martyrdom got a rope so that she could attach one pig to the wall by the hind leg while feeding the other this made no difference in the pig's feelings toward perletta they bore her a steady grudge though at the same time they had more attachment for her than for any other person they were also jealous of each other and beat and punished each other continually though they were never happy apart perletta who was as strong as a man had herself made a pen in the back yard for them and hank had built a small house but their intelligence and perversity were so great that they were rarely in this enclosure they would work their way out no matter how many obstacles were presented to them and strangely enough reverted to a wild type preferring to make their own beds rather than to sleep in the soft one provided for them their favorite lair was at the back of the garden in a tangle of currant bushes and lilacs and they could be seen frequently running from the barn with their mouths full of straw to replenish this lair they slept late in the morning but about breakfast time would appear at the back door clamoring for the nice warm breakfast perletta always had ready for them after breakfast they crossed the road and went down to the river where they wallowed in the soft mud coming back at noon for another meal and to see whether the dogs had left any bones about the yard for them to nose over though they fought each other constantly they never quarrelled with the dogs and even the puppy lost his fear of them and if they presumed to steal one of his bones would snatch it from them occasionally the pigs took it into their heads to make calls and urgent messages would come to perletta from some neighboring house that her pigs were in the yard and would not get out arming herself with a broom she would go in search of them and with mutual snarling snapping and recrimination would guide them toward their home tilda jane was kind and forbearing with the new household pets and would feed them in perletta's absence 
but hank took an amused and constant interest in them so curious did he become with regard to the habits of the genus Seuss that he bought a large natural history and devoted evening after evening to reading aloud from it to any one who would listen to him tilda jane was usually busy with her lessons so it fell to his father to become chief auditor hank soon became an expert with respect to the different types of pigs domesticated and wild large-bodied big-eared english breeds with convex backs small-bodied short-eared chinese breeds with concave backs dwarf pigs river hogs indian wild pigs french short-tusked pigs but most of all he read over and over again accounts of the doings of the long-legged large-headed and thin-bodied greyhound pigs of old ireland one bright spring evening immediately after supper he sat in the dining-room with his natural history in hand while his father listened to him from his armchair opposite just think dad hank was exclaiming what simpletons some folks are to say that any critter has no sense here it tells that pigs are intelligent if you treat em right and that their scent is fine i believe that's so for i've seen our two-track perletta grandpa said nothing and hank went on this book says one man had a pig he trained to stand to game as steady as the best bred pointer do you calculate asked grandpa dryly to let those two hogs rampage all over our garden this coming summer the weather is getting warmer it will soon be time to stir up the ground and we've always had something of a plot this year dad said hank i allowed to buy our vegetables and let the pigs snout up the garden all they like twill do the ground good to rest and the dogs and milkweed will have a chance to stretch their legs what would puppy there do with a garden and he pointed to handy andy who lay stretched out in his red plush chair grandpa hesitated a few instants then he said huskily mr waysmith will soon be taking him away in fact tis his last night with us he wants to send him to boston hank's face fell but he said nothing and stared at the dog by this time the little brindled animal had grown to be a handsome young dog his big head was lighted by a pair of brilliant and eloquent eyes that bespoke a somewhat chastened and disciplined puppy nature he did not perform half the mischievous tricks of a few months ago but he was by no means a model character yet as a large hole in the plaster in grandpa's room testified hank had discovered it an hour before as he went to get a thinner coat for his father and when he mildly remarked upon it grandpa had said testily never mind never mind it's where the dog gets his lime he looks like muffles remarked hank at last but even better looking finer somehow perhaps from his house upbringing of course that's it said grandpa shortly the dog book says that raising pups in large kennels restricts brain development for they lead a routine life this dog has been brought up like a child so he has dad and you ought to be proud of him you and tilda for you've raised him between you though i guess you've had the heft of the work tilda jane has fussed about his food and i've kept him warm nights said grandpa he'll miss us i misdoubt taking him away i don't like it he's too young maybe mr waysmith is going to bring him back again suggested hank i don't know i don't know replied grandpa bitterly that's the way with things in this world change and decay i'm breaking up i feel it don't say that dad replied hank uneasily 
why you haven't been as smart for years as you have been this winter and spring you're just a little down in the mouth on account of the pups going away i down in the mouth repeated grandpa indignantly and on account of a pup get out boy you're taking liberties hank closed his book and got up muttering to himself it's funny but it's mostly the bare solemn truth that hurts in this life half the truth don't offend then he said aloud all right dad all right i feel cranky myself tonight and something seems to tell me that i'm going to die young must be cause sissy's gone out and left us she goes so seldom young girls should stay at home said grandpa in a crabbed voice i don't believe in gadding well i guess i'll go feed the stock said hank stretching out his fat arms and by the way i mustn't forget to give tilda's pigeon some hemp that was a cute trick of little house tops yesterday dad wasn't it grandpa's face softened yes it was i like birds hank went out through the kitchen to the back yard where he shaded his eyes with his hand and looked up toward tilda jane's window yesterday her little dark pet housetop who had got into the habit of flying in and out of her room had brought another pigeon with him to the window-sill the strange pigeon though one of those accustomed to feed about the yard would not enter the house so housetop with many pleading coos and bowing prettily had given his young mistress to understand that he had chosen a little mate and as she would not come in his room he did not know what to do about a nest tilda jane had run downstairs and reported the matter to hank who told her that it would be better to move housetop's box outside the window he had accordingly fastened the capacious cracker box on a shelf near the window ledge and now the two pigeons were flying busily back and forth from the barn carrying straws to add to the already luxurious nest tilda jane had provided for them seems as if they want to do something to help said hank and passing perletta who was vigorously brushing one of the pigs being rewarded by grunts and snaps of disapproval he went to get an evening meal for the birds and hens guess i'll give them buckwheat tonight," he murmured feathered folk like a change in diet as well as humans land how we miss sissy it's wholesome for her to get out once in a coon's age but she leaves a powerful blank women and girls have a lot in their power he went on as he mechanically pursued his way into the barn now it don't seem as if tilda jane was of much account in the world but she makes a home and there are millions of homes to be made and if the home ain't made right nothing goes right women are the home keepers what can the smartest man do toward getting his breakfast if the coffee is cold and the toast burnt and the mush sour he goes out in the world with a load on his stomach and wrath in his heart that wrath's got to be poured on someone and it's all some woman's fault i rate a cook high cooks keep the peace of the world who's going to fight on smooth victuals i believe brotherly love starts in the pantry i'm a better man since i stopped having dyspepsy greasy fodder used to make me hate everyone by spells now i love all men and especially all women yes milkweed i'm a-comin good old girl you'll whinny your lungs out if you don't take care no biddies tilda ain't here you needn't cackle for her i'm going to be your provider for tonight tilda jane in the meantime accompanied by poacher and gippie who had received a special invitation had gone to spend the afternoon and evening and night with the tracys the two good persons who had advised her what to do when she first came to kiskaset and grandpa treated her unkindly 
in hank's absence they had been warm friends and safe counsellors and now at intervals in the little girl's busy life they took her to their own home for as long a time as she would stay of the three members of the household grandpa missed her most though he said least about her absence he's as dull as a beetle hank muttered an hour later as he sat staring at him dad you look tuckered out don't you want to go to bed yes i guess i'll go said the old man getting up you'll mind and put the blower on the stove so the sparks won't fly out yes sir replied hank and he got up to open the door for his father and the pup who was frolicking round him loath to go to bed so early come sir said grandpa sternly none of your nonsense and he pushed handy andy with his crutch yet at the same time his face softened where would his pet be at this time to-morrow night hank sighed as the bedroom door closed on his father if the old man wasn't so smart in his mind i'd say he was in his dotage think of hating dogs till most eighty and then turning a somersault right in the middle of indulging them grandpa could not sleep well he lay awake for hours and at last fell not into a light dozing slumber but into a heavy dream-haunted sleep that did not rest him he thought that he was a boy again hunting wild cats there they went through the woods to the swamp where their prey the rabbits abounded he could see the boys and the dogs running gleefully after them now he and his hound trip had singled out a wild cat it went up a tree but trip went too he was the one dog in the farming community that could climb a tree provided a fence were nearby to enable him to spring up among the branches in the meantime poor grandpa in his dream felt his strength giving out he fell on the soft moss and the wild cat pursued by the hound leaped from the tree to his breast he could feel it tearing and scratching at his throat would it kill him or would good dog trip descend from the tree in time to save him he would try to help himself and he put a feeble hand to his throat he could not push the wild cat away with deadly celerity it was nipping and tearing his garments soon it would reach the tender flesh with a supreme effort he roused himself and seized the wild cat by the throat he would kill it and he was just beginning to shake it violently when he awoke and discovered fortunately that the wild cat in his grasp had been changed into the petted pup handy andy end of chapter nineteen grandpa's dream chapter twenty of tilda jane's orphans this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon tilda jane's orphans by marshall saunders chapter twenty the son of muffles the old man had been sleeping in such a profound though disturbed way that it took him a few seconds to recover himself he lay puffing and panting for breath with only sense enough to relax to hold on to the struggling dog whose young eyes were starting from his head while he lay trying to come out of his dazed condition he suddenly became aware of a changed state of the atmosphere he could not get his breath for the air was supercharged with smoke he was now wide awake and his brain moved with the rapidity of younger days the house was on fire the little dog with the strange instinct of protection belonging to dogdom had roused him and his duty done now lay quietly on his chest he knew that his master was awake a quick glad thought flashed through the old man's excited brain the small animal had done his duty and had got rid of responsibility now he was waiting waiting even for death should grandpa choose to remain 
how faithful were dumb creatures more faithful sometimes than animals of a higher order grandpa did not stop to pursue this line of thought without a movement toward his crutches he sprang out of bed and stumbled to the door he opened it then slammed it together violently hall and kitchen were full of blinding smoke coughing and choking he hurried to the open window flung it up higher and threw cracked yells of appeal out on the still night air fire fire help help he could not get out of the window for he was on the ground floor but he reflected that he would probably break a leg in so doing and if he waited hank would be sure to come to him hank's room was right over his tilda jane's was nearer the front of the house hank hank son son he cried wake up the house is on fire there was no response from hank and seizing the large bell from the side of his bed grandpa rang it out the window with all his might soon he could see the meliquans coming through the darkness tumbling and hopping over each other looking like white and striped rabbits in their bed attire one of the boys ran to give alarm in the town and father and mother meliquan assisted grandpa out the window the dog first he said when they held out their hands to him he saved my life wake hank oh wake hank he called to the meliquan children who forthwith began to execute a dance of an excited and hilarious character under their neighbor's window and to bombard him with stones and any missiles they could lay their hands on and perletta grandpa added the girl sleeps like a log mrs meliquan ran to assail perletta's window vigorously with gravel and sticks and soon her tousled head appeared tell her to run to the back of the woodhouse attic called grandpa and come down the rough steps she can't get through the kitchen perletta did as she was told but hank was in a quandary front hall full of smoke also back he bawled out i'm going to jump on my bed and forthwith he began to hurl mattress bedclothes and his summer and winter garments out the window when he thought he had made a heap sufficiently soft he put a foot on the sill gave a leap and alighted without accident the house was not high and the risk in jumping was consequently small arrived on the ground he flashed a comprehensive glance at his father the pup and perletta and said every living thing is out i guess except sissy's pigeon said grandpa that's so replied hank the creature must be dazed by all this confusion and this smoke is puffing round its box now with amazing rapidity for a fat man he ran to the barn and returned with a ladder of medium size detached the pigeon box carried it down and placing it on one side threw some clothes over it otherwise the frightened creature might flutter out he muttered now friends he shouted let's see if we can save any stuff that isn't alive but no risks mind by this time the dining room kitchen and grandpa's bedroom were burning swiftly and hank called out no use trying to get in there perletta you and mr meliquan run to the back and see if you can snake anything out of the woodhouse mrs meliquan and the children come with me i guess i'll rescue a few things from the front of the house the night fortunately was not dark and the flames were now beginning to illuminate the yard and garden as the front door was locked on the inside hank smashed a window jumped in and soon was passing out the haircloth furniture tilda jane's sewing machine was here also some books and other treasured possessions placed in the best room to keep them out of handy andy's way blisters it's getting hot here muttered hank who with perspiration pouring down his face was flinging things about i guess i'll have to quit these wooden houses blaze up like matchboxes 
and with a leap he dodged a long tongue of flame coming in through the doorway and landed on the grass outside here's the fire engine shouted the meliquan children as he once more appeared among them much good it'll do growled hank they can't save anything but the cellar now a crowd of half-dressed men and boys were running beside the engine and hank soon had two or three score of willing helpers there's nothing to be done he said to the chief of the fire department but play some water on it if you want to the place is doomed the nearest hydrant is over there in front of the next house the man saw that his assistants had already found the hydrant and with a backward glance at them he said to hank there's no danger of the barn going is there no siree replied hank i took good care to have it a ways off never did see the sense of having a house and a barn clapped close together thank fortune there ain't a breath of wind to-night there goes the attic old boxes and childhood's toys well i for one ain't bound to rags and reminiscences i'll build another house there's mighty heap money goes up in flames every year in this country said mr meliquan drawing near and speaking to hank tis terrible yes terrible muttered hank it's such dead loss got any insurance asked his neighbor some not much not nearly enough to cover the loss i never foresaw this well i must skip to the barn that mare of mine will be fair crazy with all this row and he hurried away the little house was now one brilliant bonfire the flames sprang high never before had it looked such a good size and so picturesque the dancing light cast strange shadows over the yard and stable and the faces of the onlookers it was not a pleasing spectacle but it was curiously fascinating upon my soul snickered one of the firemen who was standing with a hose in his hand directing a stream of water in the middle of the pit of flame look over yonder funny spectators those his companion stared in the direction of the clump of shrubbery behind the house there side by side quietly contemplating the fire were two large white pigs they neither advanced nor retreated but presently when perletta spied them and walked up to caress them they impatiently twitched their short tails grunted and tossed up their heads then walked back into the darkness i've heard tell they were great folks for animals in this house said the first man and when i see two pigs running to a fire like two christians i believes it they say it was a dog give the alarm responded the other that's nothing new dogs has saved lots of property and lives and cats too for that matter our smell ain't in it with theirs and something seems to tell them what's coming now how did this house catch on fire grandpa was saying to hank who had walked out of the stable with his arm round milkweed's neck i found her shivering and scared to death hank remarked and i thought that with hosses like humans suspense was worse than knowledge so i brought her out see she ain't so bad now and he patted her quivering neck horses hate fire said his father well dad about the starting of it hank continued i'm up a tree the dining-room fire was most dead out when i went to bed the kitchen stove was going for perletta had been baking late but all the covers was on we ain't had any fire in the hall stove since the warm spring weather began it beats me were there any matches lying around asked grandpa we never used no sulphurs interposed perletta eagerly as she came closer to them they was all parlor matches perhaps bad flu suggested mrs meliquan i guess 
that must have been it said hank dejectedly the chimneys weren't well built when father put up this house he was cheated by a fellow that he thought wouldn't cheat most nights i'd go round upstairs to feel the woodwork but i didn't think of it last night how we get fooled you suffer and the other fellow gets the money in this poor world said mrs Melaquan softly in another twill be made up yes but it's a powerful long time to wait said hank if i had the arranging of things i'd give all my object lessons in this life according to me sinners have all the good times here and saints sweat the frenchwoman smiled a benignant angelic smile then she said sweetly and now let us think of your poor father this is shocking for him suppose he comes and enters into one of our nice warm beds two children will gladly turn out for him mr hank did you know twas the dear dog that woke your father no said hank sharply was it yes and mrs Melaguan told him that grandpa had related his wildcat dream to her hank uttered another astonished exclamation then said i won't speak to him about it tonight. he's pretty well worked up i'm a hundred times obliged to you for taking him in dad will you go home with our kind neighbor grandpa turned with a start from his contemplation of the fire where are your crutches asked hank he threw them out on the grass said mrs Melaquan, when grandpa did not reply boys look for them grandpa without waiting for the crutches to be found started off with a firm step toward mrs Melaquan's house look at that cried hank i've heard of such things before rheumatism can be shocked out of the blood by some accident like a railway collision or an earthquake or a fire but i should think dad would be too old for it it is in his old age that your father makes change said mrs Melaquan softly that's true replied hank and it shows that while there's life there's hope now i must go thank the men for coming from town with the engine i see they're getting ready to go home i will follow your father said mrs Melaquan, taking the crutches from one of her boys you and perletta will come when you like you can take her now said hank over his shoulder i'm going to stay right here tonight then come to breakfast said his kind neighbor and going up to the staring gaping perletta who had scarcely opened her mouth since the fire began she led her away with her in an hour the place was deserted by all human beings save hank he sat on the little raised platform in the yard where he groomed milkweed and where tilda jane and perletta brushed clothes and shook rugs grimy and dishevelled he surveyed the smoking ruins of his home a good chance to be cast down he soliloquized i'm not money enough to build a new home and i don't know anyone that would lend it to me except at a sky rate of interest but i ain't going to worry show what's a burnt house to what some men have to go through here you milkweed stop puffin and blowin over my shoulder that fire ain't gonna hurt you now come on to your stall pigs go back to your lair and he addressed the two curious animals who had again emerged from the shades of the garden after the crowd went away and were standing staring at him upon my words if you treat animals halfway decent they want to hang on to your coat-tails all the time he continued well i'm in need of comfort from someone or something there was a lot here i believe most folks enjoy a fire if it ain't their own house that's burnin i usually like running to a fire myself but somehow or other i didn't seem to enjoy this one what was it i was reading to dad the other night something about the most of us getting a lot of consolation out of the troubles of our friends pigs didn't i tell you to go to bed you ain't going to impose on me if i am a half-ruined man 
Stop nosing my best clothes. You'd like to lie on that thirty-dollar overcoat, would you? I guess I've saved most of my things. A pity I couldn't get into Sissy's room. Ain't I glad she wasn't here? Good, Sissy. Now I'll carry all this stuff in the barn and then lie down on the hay for a spell. The dawn's just breaking, and I'm a grown man, not a fool of a boy. I must quit repining. End of chapter 20 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 21 of Tilda Jane's Orphans This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dini Stain of Kelowna, Canada. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 21. Tilda Jane Receives a Shock. Very early the next morning, Tilda Jane came trotting from the town with Poacher at her heels, and behind him the three-legged Gippie, puffing and grunting unamiably at her haste. She had had a pleasant visit at the Tracys, and had got up early to breakfast with them before they took a train to Bangor. Not a rumor of the fire of the night before had reached her, and with a happy face and frequent glances at a basket on her arm, in which reposed a fine large fruit cake for Grandpa, who was fond of sweets, as Mrs. Tracy always remembered, she hurried along the road by the river. Her eyes leaped ahead, past the Smiths and the Dollivers, in search of the little two-storied white cottage with the tiny tower, which was the dearest spot on earth to her. Why? What did it mean? There was no cottage roof showing through the treetops that were just bursting into leaf. No neatly curtained windows were waiting to greet her like quiet, friendly eyes of the house. She broke into a run and wheeled breathlessly into the yard. Her amazed, sweeping glance took in everything. The still-smoking ruins. The deserted yard. No, not deserted for there were little housetop and his mate strutting gaily about, spreading their tails and cooing as harmoniously as if there were no such thing in the world as trouble. Tilda Jane stopped, started forwards, stopped again, and clasping her hands, looked about her. The sound of a cheery whistle broke upon her ear, and at the same instant someone threw open the big barn door. "'Oh, Hank!' she cried and dismay, grief, and anxiety were so blended in her tone that he did not know which prevailed. "'Hello, sissy,' he replied. "'The early bird gets the worm, but he misses the fire of the night before. Why didn't you come to it?' "'The fire!' she ejaculated, and with a groan she sank on one of the big parlour chairs that was reposing as naturally in the yard as if it belonged there. Hank knew that she was rather an undemonstrative girl, but her capacity for suffering was greater than that of most demonstrative persons, and he surveyed her compassionately. "'Hold on to yourself, sissy,' he said. "'Don't mourn. We're going to have another house with all the latest improvements.' "'Where's Grandpa and the pup?' she gasped. "'And Perletta?' "'Safe and sound at the Melangons, but not up yet, I guess.' It's still early, and we had a gay night. Hank, how did it happen? He told her all he knew about it, but said he had not talked much to his father for fear of exciting him. And our happy home is gone, said the little girl at last. Our bright, beautiful home. You can't burn up homes, sissy. She stared at him miserably. Homes are here, he said, laying a hand on his heart. Now you wait and by night you'll have a new first-class case for your home right on this spot. Hank, what are you talking about? His eyes twinkled. We're going to take the outdoor cure, sissy. You see this fine, clean barn? Not near as old as the house was. I'm a-going to sweep the hay off this floor, arrange this furniture we saved, buy a bit more, have a big table for eating and another for cooking on, clear away that pig pen in the yard, and have a small shelter for a cook stove, and a covered runway from it to the barn. Why, we'll live right out here then, 
interrupted tilda jane with a lightning of her worried face right here sissy and up there in the hayloft i'll fix a bedroom for you and one for perletta a few planks and nails will do it and by the time we want to put in our winter hay we'll either find a place in the neighborhood for it or else if the new house is pretty well on we'll be able to camp in it and put the hay here in its proper place tilda jane actually smiled and we'll have those big doors open all the time continued hank and drink in lots of fresh air and there won't be a heap of housework to do and you can study and go for rides hank dear brother she said rubbing her hand over her eyes and i'll clean out the harness room hank went on and fit it up for a bower for dad where he can sit and weep or smile as he chooses and put an oil stove in lest his old bones get chilly oh he won't said tilda jane happily this summer is right on us and it is so warm here by the river i don't think he'll need it still i'd like him to know it's there and if he doesn't approve i'll hire a room for him at mrs melangon's he'll be sure to want to stay with us oh dear how lovely to be out here with the animals i'll close them in they'll have their own quarters we ours said hank but this barn has always been kept clean and it's a more decent place to live in than many persons have then best of all sissy camping right here on our own property will enable me to watch the workmen as they put up our new house and if there's any scamping done i'll jump square on to them see here's the plan i couldn't sleep so i got up and sketched it on the shingle the young girl bent her head over the shingle and was soon deep in an animated discussion of the arrangement of rooms in the new house that's the way to do sissy said hank rising after a time and putting the shingle away if you get a knockdown blow jump right up and begin to lay about how to get in another at fate i'm not going to give up as long as there's breath in my body now let us go find some breakfast i'm feverish to begin cooking right here said tilda jane looking about her good for you sissy but stop till i find you the wherewithal perletta did fine in snatching a lot of cooking pots and pans out of the woodhouse see they're in a heap there but we'll have to board with mrs melangon for a few days hold on pon my misfortunes if there ain't mr waysmith and muffles is my face dirty sissy a little not much she replied it's not to be wondered at don't stop to clean yourself he won't like to wait and she stepped back so that he could go first to greet his employer well sir i take this as a kindness to come here at this early hour said hank gratefully after mr waysmith had spoken to him i was anxious about your father said mr waysmith did he get a great shock yes sir but i guess it won't hurt him mr waysmith's eyes went roving about the barn and yard he's at a neighbor's sir with the pup by the way sir it was your pup that gave the alarm mr waysmith looked incredulous then delighted in a subdued way that young thing he presently ejaculated yes sir he clawed at father and woke him when handy andy was younger he was always sleepy and heavy the first part of the night but now he's nervous and sleeps late in the morning he's just changed round in his habits i guess he was wakeful and smelt the smoke they say dogs are sensitive to it he's the true son of his father and hank pointed to muffles who was standing some distance off sniffling at the ruins of the house so the pup woke your father said mr waysmith with immense satisfaction yes sir and it looks to me as if we'd have had a pretty close shave for our lives if it hadn't been for him i'm feared father would have gone for he was right close to the kitchen i might have got out and the girl though we're both powerful sleepers i will go and call on your father said mr waysmith but i want to ask you some questions first you will of course rebuild hank glanced at tilda jane who was gazing affectionately and admiringly into the merchant's face mr waysmith had politely taken off his hat to her and she expected no further recognition she was content to stand and look at him 
but now at hank's significant nod she quietly slipped away to the back of the garden to interview dodge and grappler as to their experience during the fire poacher and gippie followed her they were both uneasy gippie kept raising his head to catch the smoky odors about him while poacher ran from tilda jane to the ruined cellar and back again too perturbed to go and greet the strange dog muffles i didn't want sissy there to know just how hard up i am said hank in a low voice i've been talking big about building but she would fret if she knew how little i have to build on have you any money at all inquired mr waysmith only five hundred insurance and my salary sir any debts no sir how much money do you need to put up another house i guess i can do it for two thousand five hundred sir i don't want any falderols i will lend you two thousand dollars without interest said his employer and when the house is finished i wish to furnish it the furniture to be a present to your adopted sister hank flushed under his grimy skin that's very handsome in you sir not at all i have money everyone knows it i had a hard time to get it and i belong to a large class of the well-to-do who long to be of benefit to young men struggling to get a footing the trouble is we can't find deserving ones once you begin to help a fellow he drops a dead weight on your hands that's the curse of riches to my mind you can't help anyone i don't want your money sir said hank sturdily except as a loan i know that said mr waysmith in his slow concentrated way if you did want it as a gift you wouldn't get it i have watched you i know that instead of spending your evenings with a set of fast young fellows as you used to do you come home and sit with your old father and try to pick up a little information from books hank looked sheepish and said nothing you may draw on me at any time for the amount i named said mr waysmith i wish the money to be paid back in the shape of monthly installments that will be equal to a low house rent say eight dollars a month hank smiled broadly you'll be a long time getting your money sir i can wait sir said the young man seriously i don't want to gush but on the other hand i don't want you to think i'm ungrateful you've never been mean you have the name of being good pay for hard work and i would like to say sir that your assistant bookkeeper won't keep your books any worse for his grateful feelings my father served you faithfully before me and i'd just like to find anyone cheating you of a cent mr waysmith gave him a keen glance was it possible that he did not know of his father's theft of the two hundred and fifty dollars the old man would not tell him of course but could the little girl keep such a secret he looked wonderingly at her as she stood down near the lilacs her dog at her heels the pigeon on her shoulder the two pigs staring inquiringly at her and wonder of wonders his own pet muffles sneaking round the smoking cellar to get to her she must tell her secrets to the animals reflected the surprised man and he whistled to muffles and strode away thoughtfully towards the malangan house most girls of fifteen and sixteen are chatterboxes what self-control for one so young sissy i say sissy exclaimed hank running after her when his employer was out of sight misfortunes turned inside out are blessings the young girl moved around deliberately on account of the pigeon on her shoulder if the misfortunes ain't your fault brother there's good in them you didn't set the fire it came upon you i'm proud to have you take it right you're braver than i am hank in a few gleeful sentences told her how mr waysmith was going to help him not bad that he added considering that we most burned up his dog if we had he would have known that we didn't mean to said the little girl softly hank i guess folks are pretty sharp at knowing what we're to blame for and what we're not sometimes i guess they are he said in a puzzled way sometimes they don't seem to i say life is a queer thing any way you take it sissy i suppose it is she said humbly i haven't lived long but i know this much hank if i make faces at people they make em back at me if i look pleasant they look pleasant 
that's it exclaimed hank and i'm going to keep on grinning some big writer said that the world is a looking-glass end of chapter twenty one Chapter 22 of Tilda Jane's Orphans. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny McCann. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 22. Cousin Una Riley. One month later, summer had fairly begun. The Dilson family had been keeping house in the barn for three weeks and the plan had proved to be a great success. They had plenty of fresh air, they had liberty, they had room, and Hank declared that the novelty of the experiment pleased them all as much as a trip to foreign parts would have done. On this balmy, sunny afternoon, the big barn doors, front and back, were thrown wide open. The main floor was their sitting-room, and chairs and tables were arranged neatly against the walls. Through the open doorways they had a wide, extended view, the road, the river and meadows in front, and a rolling farming country at the back. Grandpa sat in his big rocking chair that the Melanson's had dragged through his bedroom window the night of the fire. He was not sitting inside the barn, but right out in the yard. So enamored had they all become of fresh air that nothing but complete outdoor life seemed to satisfy them. His rheumatism was much better, and for a part of every day he walked without his crutches, using only a cane. His gaze was bent dreamily on the masons who were busy repairing the cellar walls of the old house and adding to them for the new one. He was thinking of Hank, who had taken his holidays early in the season, so that he might be at home as soon as the framework of the house was put up. "'I guess I can trust him with the foundations,' the young man had said. "'I've sworn the masons to faithfulness. But watch him, watch him, father, when I'm gone. There's an awful looseness in business honor. I don't know what's the matter with people. There are only five men in Siskaset I'd trust to clear out that cellar and add to it for the new house. And that's you and me, and honest old Joe Whiting, the lawyer, and Mr. Tracy, the minister, and Mr. Waysmith, and we ain't any of us likely to undertake the job. Hank had been gone a week, and Handy Andy had been gone ten days, for Mr. Waysmith had taken him to Boston, 
though Grandpa reflected with a comforted feeling in the neighborhood of his heart that Mr. Waysmith had hinted something about bringing him back. How he did miss that dog, and slow tears formed in his old eyes. Who would have believed that he, Hobart Dilson, would have at his time of life become so fond of a dumb creature? It was because he fancied me, thought the old man, as if apologizing for his senile affection. Like begets like. The little fellow would enjoy this life. He's fond of excitement, and he likes being outdoors. Hey ho, I wish he'd come back. What's the matter, Grandpa? inquired Tilda Jane solicitously. The old man turned and looked at her as she sat on the barn sill with a pan on her lap, paring potatoes for their supper. What you doing that for? he asked sharply. You'll make your fingers black. Let the girl do it. She's gone to town, said Tilda Jane quietly. To town? repeated the old man irritably. Seems to me she's always in town lately. What does she do there? I don't know, replied Tilda Jane in a low voice, and her face became red and troubled. Grandpa was staring suspiciously at her. What are you blushing for? I don't know, said Tilda Jane truthfully. Is that girl bothering you? No, not exactly, sir. She's always been a kind of riddle to me. There she comes now, a sauntering up the road, as if she owned it, exclaimed Grandpa. Why doesn't the girl hurry? Parletta, Parletta, I say, shove those big feet of yours along faster, and come here and do these potatoes. You ain't hired to gad, but to work. Oh, sir, said Tilda Jane protestingly, please don't. If you knew how kind she is lately, don't say a word. Grandpa sat up straighter in his chair, and stared more intently at her. Kind? How kind? What has she to do with kindness? If you knew how much she thinks of you, the little girl went on in a low voice, she's got you the cutest Christmas present. A Christmas present for me, spluttered Grandpa, in June, and cute. I'll make her less cute. Oh, don't, sir, don't go any further, implored Tilda Jane. She got it now, because it was cheaper on account of the moths. You'll be sorry, sir. She has a good business head in some ways. Grandpa was in a rage. He was really very much upset mentally on account of Hank's absence, and that of the pup, and, though his bodily health was so much improved, it did him good to have a mental outburst occasionally. He was just preparing to work himself into a tempest of wrath and scorn, and was fiercely muttering, Moths! Moths! What have I to do with moths? When, to Tilda Jane's great relief, a carriage came swiftly up the road, passed Perletta, and drove in through their open gateway. "'It's Mr. Waysmith!' exclaimed Grandpa, who had an eye as keen as an eagle's where his former employer was concerned, and with astonishing rapidity for one so old, he smoothed his perturbed forehead, changed his tone, and by the time the coachman had pulled up his horses a little way from him, his old face was wreathed with smiles. For there was Handy Andy, his beloved pet, springing from the Surrey. Right for Grandpa's neck he came, and such springing, licking, barking, and tail-wagging Grandpa had seen only once before, namely on the occasion of the return of the dog from his trip with Perletta. "'Good little boy, fine little fellow,' Grandpa murmured, stooping and patting him wherever his hand could find a resting place on the slippery back. "'What a little supplejack of a man! So, so good, doggy, lie down!' Probably Grandpa was the happiest person in Siskaset. There stood the man he admired and revered, looking down at him with an absolutely beaming face. Now he could see plainly how much his dog loved Grandpa, and the more Handy Andy jumped, the more ecstatic Grandpa became. "'Dilson,' said the merchant suddenly, "'I shall never take that dog from you again, except for shows.' "'Sir!' exclaimed Grandpa in an awed voice, and he gazed at the dog's master in a state of such supreme satisfaction that he became speechless. "'Yes, I will only take him away for shows,' repeated Mr. Waysmith. "'He has been to Boston and New York shows, and he carried everything before him in the puppy class, but large cities don't agree with him, and the sea air makes him cough.' I rushed him back to this inland place by the advice of several first-class veterinaries. He is a wonder of a dog, but if he is not carefully handled, he will be a sick, played-out specimen. A quiet life and congenial companionship were strongly advised for him. "'And he'll be my dog,' muttered Grandpa, at last finding his voice. 
my little dog till I die, cause I'll not last long. May the Lord bless you, sir. He added fervently, and in a louder key, you don't know what this is to me. And greatly to his own astonishment and mortification, he, Hobart Dilson, began to cry like a baby. Big tears, as big as a baby's, rolled down his old cheeks, and Handy Andy, in concern, stopped his prancing, and lovingly tried to lick them away. "'Stop, sir,' Grandpa managed to ejaculate irritably. "'Get out. It's none of your business. Where's my handkerchief? I say, Tilda, can't you find me my handkerchief?' The little girl silently passed him her own, and while Grandpa mopped his quivering face, Handy Andy caught sight of her, and, springing at her, began over again his demonstrations of delight at being again with his own loved family. Mr. Waysmith had politely turned away on observing Grandpa's emotion, and stepping to the surrey he brought out something wrapped in a linen duster. "'Why, sir!' exclaimed Tilda Jane, when he threw back the linen. "'It's another dog!' Mr. Waysmith smiled. "'It is Andy's half-sister, born a little while after him, and named by me Una Riley. You remember Cousin Una Riley that lived with Handy Andy's mother in Samuel Lover's story?' Grandpa had recovered himself, and was jealously surveying Tilda Jane. "'What's that, sir? What's that?' he asked suspiciously. "'I'm the one Hank read Handy Andy to. Come here, pup. Jump on my knee.' Mr. Waysmith walked toward him again. "'I was just saying, Dilson, that I have another dog here, the same stock as Handy Andy, and with an Irish name, for I liked your suggestion about your pet's name.' "'Have you brought it to us to bring up?' asked Grandpa. "'Can we do anything for you about it? The dog looks sick.' "'She is sick,' said Mr. Waysmith. Then he smiled again. "'You know, Dilson, you told me that you would take care of as many dogs as I chose to bring you.' "'I said it, sir, and I'll stick to it,' Grandpa responded emphatically. "'We're living in a barn, and we can accommodate a good many, and if the barn ain't large enough, we'll hire our neighbors.' And he laughed a shrill, happy cackle of a laugh." Mr. Waysmith bestowed a grateful glance on him. Then he said, "'I must tell you this dog's history. She was a frail puppy, something like Andy, but when very young she took a great fancy to a little boy, the son of one of the men employed in my kennels in Boston. This lad petted her very much, and I gave her to him to bring up. Unfortunately he has just died, poor boy. Though both for his own sake as well as the dog's, I did everything to save him, and since then Una will neither eat nor sleep properly. She is dying by inches. And I brought her here, thinking that possibly your little girl, and he glanced at Tilda Jane, would be kind enough to see if she can rouse her. "'Wouldn't she play with Handy Andy?' inquired Grandpa. "'He is a kind little dog.' "'He is too rough for her in her present state of health,' replied Mr. Waysmith. "'She should be kept alone. That is, from other dogs, for a while. She is as weak as water.' "'Sit down, will you, and take her in your arms,' he said to Tilda Jane. Tilda Jane hurried into the barn, and was dragging out a chair for Mr. Waysmith, when he took it from her, and motioned her to sit down herself. "'Speak to her,' he said, putting the dog in her lap. Tilda Jane looked down at Cousin Una Riley. She was a smaller dog than Andy, and was of a lighter, more golden brindle than his, while instead of his even white line between the eyes, she had a face that was half brindle, half white blaze. Her eyes were beautiful, large and full, and so pathetic that Tilda Jane's own eyes grew moist as she looked into them. "'Poor doggie,' she said, patting her softly. "'Poor doggie, you feel sad.' Mr. Waysmith, watching breathlessly, saw a flash of interest come in Una's sad eyes. Then she lifted her head and stared into the little girl's face. "'Speak to her again,' he said in a low, hurried voice, and stepping back a little. "'Life is full of trouble, isn't it?' continued Tilda Jane, addressing Una as if she were an intelligent human being. "'When I was young like you, I had lots of it, too. But I got over it. What I have now doesn't count. It isn't the little things that fret me, it's the big ones. I guess you felt pretty bad when that nice boy died.' To Mr. Waysmith's amazement, Una pushed her hot, feverish muzzle against Tilda Jane's hand, then, stretching out a pink, a very pale pink tongue, licked it gratefully. "'You're hot and tired from your journey,' said the little girl. "'Come with me, and I will give you some nice, cool milk.' 
and cuddling the sick dog to her as if she were a baby, she got up and went into the barn. The two men followed her movements with intense interest. They saw her put the dog down on the floor, then go in search of a saucer of milk. By the time she returned, Una had staggered to her feet and was licking her lips. "'There, honey, drink this,' said Tilda Jane, bending over her, and Mr. Waysmith, to his inexpressible satisfaction, saw the weary dog take the milk and then agitate her tail gratefully and stare up into her new friend's face. "'Now come, go to sleep,' and sitting down in the new rocking chair that Hank had bought, to take the place of the one destroyed in the fire. Tilda Jane took the tired animal in her arms and began to rock to and fro, and to sing as unconsciously as if she were alone a versified rendering of the old and yet ever interesting tale of Mother Hubbard and her famous dog. "'It's wonderful,' murmured Mr. Waysmith, turning to Grandpa. "'I never saw anyone with such a hold over animals.' Grandpa looked down at Handy Andy, who was reposing in his old place across his knees. "'They say animals ain't got souls,' he remarked dryly. "'But whatever they've got in the place of them, Tilda seems to look into, right down through their eyes. "'It's affection, genuine affection and interest that she possesses,' said Mr. Waysmith. "'If we all had that for each other, for animals, for criminals, and for little children, there would not be so much going astray in the world.' "'Seems funny for me, an old man, to say it,' remarked Grandpa. "'But love is a power.' Mr. Waysmith sighed sympathetically, then crept on tiptoe toward Tilda Jane. Una must have been soothed by the tale of the afflictions of the legendary Hubbard dog, for she had fallen into a sound sleep. "'Is her flesh twitching?' whispered Mr. Waysmith, with the concentrated interest of a doctor surveying a patient. Tilda Jane shook her head. "'She hasn't twitched, sir, since she dropped off.' "'Capital,' he muttered. "'She hasn't had even a catnap without starting up these last three days. "'I saw there was only this chance for her, so I hurried her up here.' "'Do you want her to be my little dog for a while, sir?' asked Tilda Jane. "'Yes, if you will be so kind. Keep her quiet and away from the other dogs. "'Poacher is down by the river with the pigs. He goes there these warm days, and Gippy is asleep in that corner.' "'He don't see as well as he did, and I guess he won't bother her. "'I'll keep both eyes on her, sir.' "'Why do you think dogs like you?' asked Mr. Waysmith searchingly. "'Tilda Jane's dreamy glance went out through the big back barn doors "'to the farms in the distance. "'When I was a tiny girl, sir, in an orphan asylum, "'there was one lady board I loved. "'She used to sit down by me and put her arm around me. "'She didn't say soft words much.' "'but I felt something when she was near. "'I guess it was cause she really and truly liked all little children. "'If she hadn't been delicate and stayed away, I'd never have run off. "'I guess she would have stood by me. "'Animals are most as smart as we are, sir, about knowing who likes them.' "'Mr. Waysmith nodded thoughtfully, "'and saying good-bye to her and to Grandpa, walked toward his carriage. "'To Tilda Jane's surprise he stopped on the way to greet Perletta, "'who had quietly entered the yard some time before "'and had seated herself on the wooden platform. "'The little girl stopped rocking the dog for a minute. "'What was Mr. Waysmith saying to Perletta "'to make her hang her head and blush, "'either with pleasure or shame? "'End of chapter 22 Recording by Jenny McCann Chapter 23 of Tilda Jane's Orphans. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begaman, Somerville, South Carolina. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 23 Perletta Puzzles Her Friends. It was late that same night. Tilda Jane and Perletta had seen Grandpa safely in his bower, as Hank called the harness room. It was really a very neat little bedroom now, and the spectacle of Grandpa tucked in bed with his beloved pup at his feet 
was so affecting to 'tilda jane that she gave a squeal of rapture and ran to embrace again and again the young dog who was so sleepy from his travels that he impatiently opened his mouth and bit at her to bid her be gone let him alone little girl said grandpa he's snappy like most folks when they're fagged out good night and pleasant dreams to you and perletta said tilda jane softly oh add perletta grandpa and perletta he said crossly now get out both of you perletta who stood in the doorway holding a lantern in her hand and not glowering at him as she used to even when she was doing him some favor but now benevolent and patient in expression uttered a pleased and surprised good night sir then led the way to the ladder by which she and tilda jane ascended to their respective sleeping places grandpa had his big bell by him as he used to have in the burned house but he was so well now that he never had occasion to ring it in the night tilda jane found una sleeping peacefully on the bed in her sweet-smelling room the loft was pretty well empty of hay now but the odor remained and whether it was owing to that or to the good supper the little creature had taken she was certainly reposing well and with none of the twitchings of flesh that mr waysmith so much dreaded tilda jane undressed said her prayers and was soon sleeping soundly beside her new pet while gippie reposed in his box in the corner poacher the guardian of the family in hank's absence lay downstairs by the front barn door that had been barred for the night you'll get plenty of air through the windows at night hank had said before he went away don't leave the doors open some tramp might sneak in and frighten you the whole family slept but perletta she was wide awake and leaning far out the window in her end of the loft stared out at the road faintly gray and dusty in the moonlight and at the silver line of the river beyond her thoughts however were not on the beauty of nature as tilda jane's would have been perletta was too material to experience heartfelt and comforting raptures over a sunset or moonrise she was rejoicing in the possession of a secret a most important and substantial sort of secret and with irrepressible chuckles she gazed down into the cellar of the new house where the masons were carrying on their work of repair i could fix em up better nor they're plannin to be fixed she muttered gleefully if they'd let me they'll have to do the squire thing though who's that comin a man as i'm alive it was true as she stood leaning out the window and soliloquizing a man had entered their yard and was swinging up at a good pace toward the barn door he was carrying a suitcase in his hand and as her eye fell on it her expression of alarm changed to one of cunning and relief it's him she said and if lil tilda jane don't wake up and poke in i'll have some fun a badgerin him to even up for the time he badgered me and slyly withdrawing her head from the window she took up the lighted lantern beside her and went stealthily down the ladder to the barn floor the man was knocking softly hello there hello didn't i see a light let me in who's a knockin asked perletta in sepulchral tones it's me replied a well-known voice and who's me she asked with a grin of reminiscence hey there you perletta was the reply you think you're awful funny don't you open this door and let me in get out you tramp she replied with assumed wrath the boss of this ranch is away he told me to stand guard as i was the biggest said he perletta 
you're to let no one in at night and if thieves come mind you stand in front of dad and tilda and let em hit you fust oh swallow that nonsense said hank impatiently and open this door do you hear perletta was so convulsed with laughter that she had to set her lantern on the floor then composing herself she seized poacher by the neck as he was throwing himself against the door in transports of delight your voice she said gruffly is like the boss's but i mistrust you he's off on a fishing trip we've got valuables in here a sewing machine and nice black furniture and a new dog with a million etc etc now look here perletta said hank in a rage if you don't open this door i'll knock it down you can't do it she chuckled go away mr robber and a thief honest folkses is in bed and rogues is a runnin hank in exasperation started such a pounding on the door that perletta seizing the lantern fled toward the ladder and climbed to her perch in the hayloft tilda jane awakened by the noise felt confusedly for una who was yelping with alarm then she began to crawl out of bed her first thought for grandpa suddenly the lantern was thrust through the curtains of her doorway and perletta gasping with laughter ejaculated it's hank go let him in tilda jane with a hasty pat on una's back threw on some clothing swung herself down the ladder with a celerity born of much going up and down and was soon unbarring the door for hank who was tired and in more of a temper than she had ever before seen him in where's that idiot that simpleton that witless lout he cried as he stamped into the barn if i'm spared till morning she'll march oh hank dear you don't mean perletta exclaimed tilda jane in dismay don't say anything against her wait till i tell you how good she's been good she's a beast a demon said hank wildly i never did like her i hate her now to shut a fellow out of his own house in the dead of night did she try to keep you out asked tilda jane oh hank isn't she waggish she's trying to pay you back for that trick you got off on her when she came back after running away with puppy and the pigeon how dare she spluttered hank i'll teach her good london hear that man roaring and that bell a-ringing yes sir i'm coming hurry hank hurry i hate to have him worked up and tilda jane lantern in hand flew toward the harness room where grandpa and handy andy were both yelling at the top of their lungs to the accompaniment of the dinner bell the barn is on fire the pup and i will burn alive shouted grandpa with one leg out of bed help me someone oh i feel so feeble get back sir get back cried hank dashing in before tilda jane the barn ain't on fire and ain't going to be and you know it you just want a mite of attention get into bed there's a lady coming your son will wrap you up and he affectionately bundled his father back to his warm nest trying meanwhile to ward off attacks from the relieved and delighted andy who was trying to devour him with caresses grandpa submitted blissfully to his tucking in he had his son back and the pup in addition now he was an entirely happy man still there was one drop of bitterness in his cup now that he thought of it you talk of a lady son he mumbled with concern you ain't married be you married ejaculated hank scornfully i'm pretty daring but i dasn't bring another female into this nursery which is alive with em already how do you s'pose tilda and perletta would greet a lady Andy, 
get down i say sir i'm glad you've got your dog back and he's riotous to see me it's kind of cheering to have something show joy if it's only dumb critters and he caressed poacher who was affectionately licking his dusty shoes as he could reach no other part of his person only dogs and my old dad think anything of poor hank i guess you're tired brother said tilda jane calmly you know how much perletta and i think of you perletta that witch exclaimed grandpa who now that his fit of temper and fright was over was beginning to get the drift of things and to understand that tilda jane was the lady hank had referred to what's the matter with that girl she's powerful cheeky lately seems as if a new spirit had got into her i wouldn't call it cheeky sir suggested tilda jane mildly she's out more but she hasn't been cheeky in the house not since hank left till tonight when he came home so i'm the one that's upsetting her am i said hank resentfully well miss perletta can go we'll find another girl what made you come home so soon boy asked grandpa your time ain't up you've only been gone a week i guess i got homesick said hank sulkily beds were hard and rooms were stuffy and fish scarce wherever i went and food not fit to eat i got dyspepsy and begun to hate everyone and thinks i those masons are fooling dad about the cellar i'll bet and so i thought i'd come home and this is the welcome i get tilda jane why don't you go to bed instead of standing there like a sick ghost good night then she said sweetly sleep well brother and grandpa i'll leave the lantern i can go up the ladder in the dark as she climbed upward she muttered i never knew before that it made a man so mad to be locked out of his own barn but i guess he'll be all right in the morning why una and she greeted the delighted little dog who had slipped off the bed and was waiting for her in the dark at the top of the ladder is that your soft tongue licking my hand i thought it must be gippy good girly i won't leave you again her philosophical prediction with regard to hank came true he was all right in the morning and acted as if he were quite ashamed of his surliness the night before he overwhelmed tilda jane with attentions and even threw a forgiving glance toward perletta who was warily keeping in the background pawn my appetite he said feelingly as he pushed his chair back from the breakfast table set in the middle of the barn floor i ain't tasted a meal like that since i left home and it's simple enough too you're a regular homebody said grandpa whose delight at having him back was too strong to be concealed your mother was he added in a lower key you take it from her hank looked quickly at him his father rarely spoke of the mother dead now so many years ago that hank barely remembered her i guess she was a pretty good woman weren't she dad he said i just call up having her lay her hands on my head she was a good woman said grandpa and his old head dropped on his breast then raising it he said keenly and i for one don't want to see no other in her place while i'm alive hank smirked at handy andy who was going round underneath the table untying everybody's shoelaces dad you've got a wholesale fear of my getting married but don't you fret i ain't likely to set no daughter-in-law over you this is your house as long as you live if you married hank said tilda jane wistfully would i have to leave no siree said the young man striking the breakfast table with his fist yes she would cried perletta 
advancing from the back of the barn and speaking in a cross and surly voice hank looked her up and down with mingled amusement and disdain then he said and please who would support you two babes in the wood i'd do it replied perletta drawing up her big frame majestically what on pursued hank with twinkling eyes money responded perletta oracularly then she withdrew into the shade of a clump of lilacs by the back barn door dad said hank turning to his father what a pickle you've got me into with these young females on account of your talk of marriage and i ain't got no more idea of such a thing than you have i guess you're a free man said grandpa tartly you ain't beholden to no females about what you'll do or not do i ain't beholden said hank but mark me it ain't wise nor agreeable to stir up any female beyond teething age let sleeping dogs lie is a good saying and i add let sleeping womankind lie too till they choose to wake themselves now i'm a-going to interview the masons out there then we'll trot down by the river to talk over my troubles with the pigs i see they've led poacher down already my it's queer not to have to hurry off to the mill fine too you don't enjoy rest unless you have worked and you don't properly enjoy work unless you rest a bit once in so often guess i'll take milkweed and getting up he went to the door of her stall opened it and allowed her to follow him like a dog down to the river perletta was still sulking at the back of the barn tilda jane was smiling sedately and after calling to hank walk up and down the willow path brother i'll run down and see you as soon as i finish the dishes she hurriedly began to clear off the breakfast table a short time later hank with poacher at his heels was pacing up and down the river bank his hands were in his pockets he was whistling cheerily watching meanwhile milkweed who was munching the sweet meadow grass and the pigs who were in their favorite mud bath near a tangle of alders hearing an answering whistle he looked up and saw tilda jane stepping carefully down the bank holding una under her arm hank she said when she got near him will you send poacher to play with the pigs i want una to walk about a spell absquatulate skedaddle make tracks said hank to the hound who laying his ears back went to join dodge and grappler the two pigs received him with amiable grunts and even climbed out of their bath to touch him with their snouts in a friendly fashion now dear pace up and down behind us said tilda jane to the small timid dog and she set her on the well-worn path by the river una with ears clapped tight to her head tail between her legs and quivering with excitement and anxiety followed closely her nose close to tilda jane's ankles seeing that she would take no harm from the exercise tilda jane turned to hank brother i can't tell you how glad i am to have you back i've been so upsot no upset about perletta since you went away that i didn't know what to do what's the matter with the girl asked hank carelessly why hank she's getting money somewhere lots of it money he ejaculated stopping short yes brother and she goes to town nearly every day i wish she'd tell us what she's doing why didn't you ask her i did brother i said perletta i'm bothered about you is everything all right about what you're doing what did she say she said time would tell you say she has lots of money how much five dollars 
five dollars exclaimed tilda jane rolling her eyes toward some men who were passing in a boat on the river why she's just bought grandpa a fur-lined coat that cost i don't know how much i know she said they took thirty dollars off cause she got it out of season they don't like to pack their furs away now at the beginning of summer on account of moths she bought dad a fur-lined coat blurted hank taking his hands out of his pockets and looking at them as searchingly as if he might find written on them an explanation of the mystery why sissy you can't buy a decent fur-lined coat less than ninety or a hundred dollars and usually they're a heap more well hank she's got money left for i saw a roll of bills sticking out of her purse it wouldn't shut and she had a piece of twine round it and brother she added shamefacedly she's given me something too what is it a party dress she said it's pink silk and awful pretty but too bold for me folks would stare a pink silk dress repeated hank why how you talk and what has she got for me nothing she said she asked her lawyer what to buy for you and he said you were a young man and if any presents were to be made you should give them to her not she to you well i be jiggered said hank in utter mystification her lawyer and who is he i want to know mr joseph whiting old joseph whiting the smartest and honestest lawyer in town and a howling aristocrat you don't mean to say she's been to him yes hank she showed me his name at the foot of a letter signed big and full with a lot of curly cues at the end asked hank excitedly yes brother just like snakes that's old whiting's signature i see it a dozen times a week at the mill but what under the sun would he be writing to perletta for now hank remarked tilda jane firmly perletta ain't i mean hasn't been stealing she isn't that kind i was afraid of it at first then i thought what a goose i was perletta is good i feel it course she is said hank kindly she's a regular zany but the girl is honest enough you can tell by her eye i guess i know what it is tilda she's come into some money there ain't a soul in this town would give her a dime i expect that's it said tilda jane soberly yet at the same time i feel kind of uneasy about her she isn't spending it right she's like a child hank can't you do something is she doing her work all right yes except when she goes to town a lot well we hired her to do certain work if she does it we can't complain if she goes too much tell her you can't spare her her money is her private concern i can't meddle that ain't business but i'd return the pink silk sissy tell her you told me about it and i ain't willin for you to keep it she'll feel bad can't help that she ain't going to make a ninny of you too do you suppose grandpa will take the coat wait till she offers it he'll settle her pretty quick but hank she's awful good to make such presents course she is but dad and i ain't willin to fatten off any poor goose cap like perletta let her keep her money for herself she ain't likely got much you hold on a bit i'll keep my eyes open and i warrant you i'll make some discoveries in perletta's direction End of chapter twenty three